episode 17 of the Wild Fed podcast, Sugarin Maple Syrup 101 with Katherine Hopkins is brought to you by a nutrition company I personally founded 12 years ago. Sir Thrival produces dynamic, highly regenerative nature-based supplements and superfoods to fuel your adventures and help you recover from long days in the field. Sir Thrival's premier lines of colostrum, elk antler velvet, CBD, pine pollen, and medicinal mushrooms support improved performance, robust health, advanced recovery, and peace of mind. Level up or restore your body and mind with the most powerful regenerative foods in the natural world. Check out the lineup at SirThrival.com. For those of you that ordered season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you received episode seven yesterday. That episode's called Waiting and Waiting in the Peat Bog, and it follows Avani and I as we paddle out by canoe to a floating peat moss island that's host to a beautiful colony of wild cranberries. We flash back to a couple of early autumn harvests of black elderberry and lion's mane mushrooms, and then spend the rest of our time hunting white-tailed deer for a small dinner we host with friends and neighbors. If you aren't currently subscribed to the show, go over to wild-fed.com to purchase season one. Seven episodes are available to watch now, and you'll receive the final episode of the season next Monday for a total of eight episodes. Each are 30 minutes long, and the feedback we've gotten from our viewers has been amazing. To all of you that have been watching, thank you so much. I know you can tell how much we put into making these shows, and it's been an honor to share them with you. Now, if you've been listening to the show each week, appreciating the guests and enjoying the information and inspiration you've gotten from it, then I think it's fair to ask for this one simple thing. Go over to iTunes and leave us that five-star rating and review. Hey, if you're one of those ultra-conscientious folks who believes in giving back and has already done it, then please know I've personally read your review. I read them all, and you are sincerely appreciated. You're good. You're off the hook. But... If you've been tuning in week after week or even just occasionally and you've heard me say this over and over and you just simply haven't taken the time to do it, please ask yourself right now. And I mean really take a moment to check in. Ask yourself, how much time does Daniel and his team invest in me each week making this show? Not just recording these intros, but lining up the guests, traveling to interview them, editing and formatting, and then putting the recordings out there for free so I can be edified. And all they're asking of me is to take a couple of moments to hit a five-star button and type out that short review. But I haven't. I mean, what's going on with me? Why have I chosen, consciously chosen, not to do this? Is this a pattern of mine? And if the answer is yes, then break that pattern right now. Go leave us that five-star rating and review. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild fed. Food is all around you. Okay, today's interview is with Katherine Hopkins. She's an extension professor at the University of Maine and the director of the North American Maple Institute. She even helped create the new grading system for maple syrup. You remember those old grades? It was grade A and grade B. Those left consumers feeling like there was some hierarchy of syrup qualities, and she's helped to rectify that. You'll learn a bit more about what those meant and what the new grading system is, but you'll also learn so much more. At the end of this podcast, you'll be pretty up to speed on all things maple syrup. Now, I've been looking at the weather, and it looks like I'll be unpacking my maple syrup making gear next week. That means tapping 75 trees, hanging buckets, carrying sap by hand each day, and cooking and cooking and cooking until I've put away enough maple syrup and sugar for the year. The best part is I'm still sitting on nearly two gallons of last year's maple syrup. Mission accomplished. Or as my francophonic wife would say, mission accompli. And as I've said, in this interview, you're going to learn all about maple syrup, how and why the trees are capable of this miracle, and how the industry works, also about which states and provinces are producing it. To me, maple syrup is one of the most important and practical wild foods I harvest and process all year. Just like hunting and fishing can supply nearly all the protein you eat, maple trees can produce nearly all of the simple sugars you need, and I'm always amazed that I can produce it right here in my front yard. Now, I know that many of you listening aren't in a part of the world where you can make your own, but I think you owe it to yourself to listen in and learn all you can. It might even motivate you to buy some or to barter with other wild food folks that you know. 
If you do live in a place where maple syrup can be made, I hope this interview gives you that little push you need to get out there and start sugaring. Or maybe you live in an area where other species can be tapped and whose sap can be cooked down to sugar like birches and walnuts. If so, I hope this conversation inspires you to get out on the landscape and start producing your own syrup. I made eight gallons of syrup last year, which is more than enough for our needs, but I didn't start doing that overnight. I started with just a couple of taps so I could drink the unreduced sap. It's like a sweet water. Years later, I started getting serious 25 taps and slowly built my collection of gear until I was sugar self-sufficient. So don't be afraid to experiment, start small, and see where the journey leads you. Next week, I'll be talking with my friend Connor Sullivan, outdoor writer, hunter, fisherman, and fisheries conservationist about breaking down the barriers to fishing. A Coast Guardsman, Connor has been stationed in the Northeast, Hawaii, and Alaska, and those moves forced him to approach each of these vastly different fisheries as a beginner. His experience may help you get started, become a better angler, or just approach fisheries with new eyes. But for now, sit back and enjoy the sweet, syrupy sounds of Catherine Hopkins, a sugarer who never gets tapped out. Catherine, those terrible puns are for you. Well, I'm here at the University of Maine's Cooperative Extension in Skowhegan, Maine, and my guest is Kathy Hopkins. And Kathy, could you tell us a little bit about what you do here? What's your title and, and what you do here? What are your job responsibilities? My title is Extension Educator. I work for the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, and Extension is the informal education arm of the university. So Extension is located in every county in the state, okay. and there's an office and, and staff in each county, and we focus on two major areas, the Maine Food System and 4-H and Youth Development. And your background, your degrees are in, uh, it looks like I think you had a, a bachelor's in soil science. Well, I'll let you explain. T- tell us about your, your background and, and your education. My, uh, my education was at the University of Maine, and I have a bachelor's degree in plant and soil science, which is now sustainable agriculture. Uh, and I have a master's degree in um, science education. And my my focus was uh, ecological education. Okay, and then today it seems like your focus is really, and we found you looking around saying, who speaks on behalf of the state's maple syrup producers and, and, and education and science? And we were looking for that person, and it's you who kept cropping up. How did you become involved with maple syrup, maple trees, maple syrup, and, and the work that you do now? And, and what is that work, and what's that look like? Well, I... Everybody makes a little syrup when they're <laughs> young. Yes, I mean, everyone has a few trees. They tap the trees and make syrup. And so so I was not unfamiliar with making syrup, maple syrup. Uh, and my first week on the job, I think, two producers came in and leaned on the counter and said, we want to see the new ag educator. And when I came out, they said, do you know that Somerset County is the largest maple syrup producing county in the United States. And what are you going to do about it? (laughs) And that's what started me off working with the maple syrup industry. It's statewide, not just in Somerset County, but statewide. Okay, so you you oversee statewide. Your your reach is statewide. It's funny you said everybody starts off like that. So a lot of people who are going to see this or listen to this are going to be like, nope, didn't grow up doing that at all. <laughs> um, and that leads me to the next question. It's like, where is maple syrup produced in and not just in the state, but in the in the country and internationally in the world? Where are the places? Uh, like how, how broad is the range of maple trees that can be tapped? And then where can it actually, can syrup actually be produced? The maple syrup producing region is North America and more precisely northeastern, north central North America. So about as far west as you can go and find trees to make maple syrup is the eastern part of Minnesota. Oh, no kidding. It's as far, as far west as you can go using maple syrup, um, sugar maple trees, okay. red maple trees, right. or whatever. There is a small uh, big leaf maple, which mm-hmm. is box elder, basically, <clears throat> uh, industry in British Columbia. Oh, no way. They So box elder, uh, for those 
box elder is uh, in the genus Acer. Yes. It is a maple, even though we call it a, yes. an elder. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't look like a maple leaf, mm-hmm. but it is in the maple genus. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they run in the spring as well. So they have a little okay. festival out there, the Big Leaf Maple Festival, and they have a good time with that and make some syrup, and it's all great. Um, you can go as far south as the mountains of Virginia. There's no. a there's a producer at in, altitude or something. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the conditions are right. Wow. But only in the in the you know higher up in the mountains uh, of Virginia. That's as far south as you can go, pretty much. How and, far north? Yeah. Um, well, somewhere in central Quebec. You know, central northern Quebec is. You know, until you run out of maple trees. <laughs> that's my next question. It can, it's not the condi- like as we go south and as we go west. It's conditions, which I, we'll get to in a minute. But but the conditions change, right? For the the distribution of maple trees continues on, I assume. But the because uh, that would lead me to also to the question: What about um, Europe? What about um, you know uh, Eastern and Western Asia? Are there m- are they capable out there? Do they not have maple trees or do they not have conditions? Do you know? It's, it's more the conditions. Yeah. There okay. are maple trees in Europe, but uh, they don't seem to have uh, an industry mm-hmm. to speak of. In Korea and Japan, there, is, there isn't a syrup industry, but there is a tradition, especially in Korea, my understanding is, of tapping maple trees and... Drinking the sap yeah. in the spring is a tonic. Okay, that's something I like doing too, actually. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of folks that I talk to about it will start off just tapping a tree, getting the sap, drinking it, putting it in the blender with, you know, making smoothies or mm-hmm. something like that mm-hmm. before they commit to the whole process. So, and delicious. I like doing that. But north, it's that the forest begins to change then. Yes. So you start getting into that boreal forest where right. there just aren't maple trees. Right. Okay, right. but you'd still have that freeze thaw cycle. Right. I guess that would lead me to that, <clears throat> would be a, the next thing I, I, I'd want to ask you about is is can you describe the conditions that are required to make maple syrup so that people understand uh, how finicky that actually is it, it's very weather dependent yeah. so the 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 sap runs in the trees when the temperatures during the day are 40 maybe 45 is ideal and you have to have a freeze at night so at nighttime the temperature has to drop below freezing and and then during the day be 40 or 45. It's nice if the sun is out and there isn't a strong wind because that the wind chill affects the trees as oh, well. So you got so, convective breeze blowing heat off of the tree, basically. You can get okay. that, yeah. So you need to have the freeze. I'm trying to think of how to word this. Is it a chicken and egg thing or is it do you need the freeze the night before to fill the tree with the sap? And then the warm day after, like if you have an interruption of sap flow and there's no flow, what needs to happen first, the warm day or the cold night in order to get flow? Ooh. Well, center. that's a good question. <laughs> the, yeah. like I it, think the critical part is having that cold night. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Followed by a warm day. Yeah. Can yeah, you describe so. a little bit or something we talked about before the interview is the, the whether or not the science on how this phenomenon works whether it's settled or not and my impression i was speaking to a botanist the other day and he said well let me look at it again because it may have changed since the last time i looked at it and then he came back and said okay things are getting a little clearer now um can you describe as at least as best we know right now what what causes this sort of pump of that moves that sap around well part of it is that fluctuation in temperature so the the trees are dormant all winter uh, hopefully they had a, a great summer last summer mm-hmm. and didn't have a long drought period in the fall going into winter before okay. they went dormant. You want them to be fully hydrated going into dormancy. And if they were, then as they come out of dormancy, then the the temperature fluctuation causes the tree to start bringing up water from the soil um, the the sap rises through the tree during the day and it starts to fill the branches because the sap is going to provide the hydration for the buds to swell 
when the temperature continues warming. So you're, you're hydrating the tree. The tree is becoming hydrated. Um, and then at night it cools back down and, and the, there's a reaction that happens in the sap with carbon dioxide and, uh, and the vessels in the tree. Ooh, I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your getting site, into finding, a mess here. Finding your edge there. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, yeah. and so, so the, the misconception is that sap just rises from the roots mm -hmm. and you're tapping it on. And when you tap a tree, you're taking the sap as it's coming up from the up roots. from the bottom that would but be the you, intuitive idea right it makes sense doesn't it it seems like it yeah. makes sense but in fact it's the this hydration that's moving throughout the entire tree so some of it's coming up from the roots some fills the branches and starts its way back down again so you're getting sap from throughout the tree from the tops from the roots you know how long have, how long have we been doing Who's doing the science, actually, would be my first question, because this has been going on a long time. All right, actually, we're going to back it up even further. When I, If I ask you about the history of maple syrup production, sugaring as a, as, a, as a thing practiced by people, in your internal timeline, like where do, where, how far back does it go for you as far as like what you've looked at, what you've studied, and what you know about it? For who? For, who for yeah, for production of syrup. Like I know that uh, Europeans learned it from the native peoples of this region. Um, do we have any sense, or do you know? How, I don't know what what how much of this you know about, but do we have any sense of how long this has been going on, as far as people understanding that they could reduce? I'm sure people have known anybody who lived in the range of these trees would have figured out there was sweetness in the sap at some point. But do we know how long they've been reducing it down and actually producing? either a sugar or, or a, a syrup. Is there any sense of that? Um, I really, I can't really give you a date mm -hmm. of, of when the native peoples mm -hmm. first began doing it. Um, but certainly they've, that was their tradition, their heritage. Yeah, Pre-existing um, European arrival here. Correct. Yeah. Yes. And, and there was really no syrup at that point in time because there was no way to store it. Yeah, so right. it was all boiled down into sugar yeah. and stored in birch bark containers that they made yeah. and, and stored for the year for their, for them to use, right. you know, throughout the year. Um, and the same when Europeans learned how to make syrup uh, or sugar, from the Native Americans, um, they didn't make syrup either, really. I mean, they would have syrup if they were in the process of boiling right, it down. Right, through and, the syrup And they phase, had some, right. you know, they would maybe make something and have syrup on it. But they also had no storage. Yeah. So for, for clarification time. for people, you're, you're saying essentially it has to do with, like, now we have glass and canning jars and plastics and all these ways that we can contain it. Right. In the syrup phase, but <clears throat> right. prior to that, containers were. Uh, uh, I think that's one of the things. Looking historically at people, it's like I think uh, we think a lot about you know fire or hunting implements mm -hmm. or all those things, but I think containers are the thing that were really at a premium right. through a lot of human history, right? And now yes. we're drowning in containers, right. filling landfills right. with them. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we <laughs> we have more than enough containers. But yes. um, so so obviously it would be all boiled down to to the sugar phase. Yeah, um, and that's sort of how I got here asking this question was. People have been doing this for a long time. Right. This has been no the 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 procedure was known, but the science is new, uh, or relatively new in comparison. How long have we been really digging in, and who is digging into that science? Well, you know, university uh, mostly university researchers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in forestry departments or botany departments, yeah. have done the bulk of that work. You mm -hmm. know, how does sap transfer actually happen? What mm -hmm. is going on in the tree? Yeah. And there have been a number of of changing theories over the years as research has become more sophisticated, mm -hmm. and it's easier to well, not easier, but. Um, you know, when you do scientific research, what you generate mostly is more questions yeah. and a few conclusions maybe, but <laughs> those usually lead to more questions. So it's been an ongoing Which they should. Which process. They should. Yeah. Right. That's the nature of science and yeah. scientific discovery. So uh, it will keep on. Yeah. It will continue. Um, one interesting 
aside, I would say about the sugar was somebody gave me an article once. It was a clipping from a Maine newspaper from the Ellsworth area, I think. And there was an editorial. It, it was written like an editorial or a column or a letter to the editor by a farmer who was exhorting people in Maine, everybody in Maine, this was in the 1830s, to go make maple sugar. Everyone had trees. He said everyone could be making sugar, and it would be a way to stamp out the evil uh, West Indies slavery-based sugar industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's a really interesting point. Right? It was. I thought it was Because there was quite a trade going, if I understand it, that would go from here to the West Indies to Europe and back, right? It involved cod. It involved rum, which was coming from the sugar industry down there. Right. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really interesting. So that, wow. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. No, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, where was I going with that, though? I was asking about the science. Oh, and it seems to me that one of the things you've been involved in is, is best, the development of best practices. Um, that stuff's obviously coming out of the science. Um, where are we at with that today? And, and that seems like something that uh, has advanced quite a bit. And we just, you and I just met with uh, Jeremy over at uh, Strawberry Hill um, and getting to see what he's doing and the implementation of a lot of these best practices. So what's your involvement been with that and in, in, uh, in helping to, or, or at least uh, being part of the, the changing of uh, procedures and practices? Well, it's, it's uh, I think it was 14 years ago, uh, a group of extension educators from across the maple producing region got together for a meeting and said, you know, what's the biggest need in the industry now? What, mm. what is it that we as extension educators ought to be addressing? And what came out of that was the fact that that food safety was becoming more and more of an issue, that uh, proper techniques for making a food safe product were more and more important, and, and that there was a wealth of conventional wisdom mm. out there because we'd always done it this way that maybe wasn't really the best way to yeah. do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a group, there were three of us basically from Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont that got together, and we came up with some best practice manuals in the different states, which have spread to all the other maple-producing states, and we developed something called the Maple Grading School where people mm -hmm. come and we talk about how to produce a, a high-quality product that's stable, that uh, isn't going to be contaminated by anything, that you know is going to be uh, stable in its pure and natural condition, mm -hmm. and um, and really exemplify the the gourmet image yeah, yeah. that Maple has been promoting and has acquired over time. Um, so it just, it was, it's been kind of a, a journey that, well, it's, it was one of those journeys that it's time for us to do this. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just making a little syrup out in the, in the woods anymore. Yeah, it's like it's, an old timey moonshine operation. Right. That it kind of, it's now, uh, you know, everybody yeah. used to do that and it yeah. was fine and you ate it in your family. Well, now it's becoming more commercialized. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing necessarily mm -hmm. because everybody doesn't have access to yeah. maple trees. People don't live on farms yeah. anymore and they mm -hmm. can't make their own syrup. So part of this built out of that is uh, how to develop the highest quality product. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, who are the players at present? You mentioned sort of the geographically where this can be done. And I'm sure there are states where there is some production, but who are the main players um, in the U.S. and Canada, uh, as far as states and provinces that are really the active participants in the industry right now, in in the U.S., the biggest producer is Vermont. Really? And yes, they. Everybody in Vermont <laughs> makes syrup. Everybody, <laughs> because you you have to if you live in Vermont, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
They they are the number one state. Because they're a bit diminutive um, are, geographically in size, so I'm surprised that Maine uh, isn't doesn't rival them in that sense. Well, it's something that developed over time. I think um, you know my understanding of the transition of the the history of production is before the Civil War, everybody in New England made syrup. That's where the bulk of the production was after the Civil War. After the Civil War and soldiers went away and discovered that the great Midwest had all this wonderful land that didn't have rocks in it, (laughs) they all left Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont, Mm -hmm. and they went to the Midwest. And um, plus they had cut down a lot of their trees to make farmland in New England. So they went all went to Ohio and that's right after the Civil War the maple industry in this country was located in Ohio pretty much. Wow. And the, the equipment They took that knowledge inventors. with them there. Yes. Yep. And the trees were there. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they did that. And since New England had emptied out, that allowed the trees and forests to grow back. Okay. And then they cut down all the trees to make <laughs> farmland in Ohio. So they had they to come back, back to New England. Okay, okay. And when they did that, they went to Vermont. And so Vermont has spent 100 years developing okay. its industry. Oh, all right, all right. Okay, So makes sense. Yeah. And I'm just, as a Mainer, I just feel that New England rivalry, but I love the state of Vermont, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but so Vermont's the big player. And then yes. who else? And number two is New York. It used really? To, used to be Maine. Uh, no way. New York has overtaken us. Wow. They are also a big state. They are with a, a huge lot, state. Yeah. 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 So uh, Maine is number three. Okay. And so Maine, Ver, uh, Vermont, New York, and Maine are the three biggest states. But then you have New Hampshire, which is a small state, Massachusetts, um, Rhode Island has an industry, West Virginia has an industry. No kidding. Um, Connecticut. Yeah. Connecticut has the highest valued industry. Why is that? Because of the the demographics of yeah. their population. Yeah, yeah. A lot of money moves so, through that state. Yeah. And then what about our neighbors to the north? How's it play out up there? Uh Quebec makes about eighty percent, eighty to eighty five percent of the world syrup production. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Eighty percent. Yeah. Yep. They're very big. Ontario has a yeah. And remember, the provinces are huge. Are Ontario massive. and Quebec yeah. are very large yeah. provinces. And so uh, they make the bulk of Canada's syrup, but also Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Um, well, I guess it's probably Ontario, yeah. uh, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Yeah, and now they have a – I'd be curious what you – your comments on how they run the industry up there, because I've, I've sort of seen some two sides of it. I, I heard today um, from a producer here about how uh, Quebec's uh, helped to stabilize the market, and that seems to have really benefited people down here. I've also uh, seen some videos from Quebec where Quebecers are feeling, where, where some producers up there have felt like their hands are tied with how they can distribute uh, and sell their product, and then feeling almost like, uh, well, I guess it's developed like a black market industry up there as well. So how do you kind of see all that, and, and what are the politics involved, and how, and how is it different in the U.S.? Um, is U.S. following is the U.S. following that um, in that direction, or are we um, doing things differently? And and how are the two countries either benefiting each other or or affecting each other? I guess I would say that. Quebec has stabilized the world industry, and I think every other producer, state or province, benefits from Quebec's, um, from the federation in Quebec. They have stabilized the market and prevented these swings. In a good Mm. year, you have a lot of syrup, the price goes down. In a bad year, the price goes way up because there isn't that much syrup. So by by warehousing uh, syrup and setting quotas for producers, um, that is what has basically stabilized the world price, which is a benefit. They set quotas for the producers. Yes. In other words, they have to keep up with a certain amount of production. 
they can only have a certain oh, amount of production. They're limited in what they can produce. Right. Right. Ah, okay. So there's a bit of a governor on how much production can happen. Right. So as not to flood the market. Right. Okay. But but that so the problem with that is especially if you're from Quebec is that you don't have the freedom mm-hmm. to do with your business what you'd like to. Yeah. You you are told how much you can sure. produce and um and out of that, you know, Quebec does a lot of marketing that benefits every producer. Mm-hmm. So so I guess it depends which side of which border you're on, yeah, whether yeah. you think that's a that's good, a good thing, thing or a bad or thing. Sure. You know, it benefits the yeah. world market by stabilizing it, doing the marketing, promoting maple syrup. Um, but maybe if you lived in Quebec, you'd like to make a little more yeah, syrup. Yeah, of course. Um, no, that makes a lot of sense. You yeah. know, and, and you... So so there are stresses there to to get something, you have to give up something. Mm-hmm. And so Quebec folks have given up some of their freedom mm-hmm. in return for that stabilized price. Mm-hmm. Um, the rest of the producers don't are, are benefiting from that freedom, I uh, mean, from that stabilized price without having to re- relinquish their freedom. Right. I want to get to that stabilized price in a second because I'm curious what the price is now and, and what kind of fluctuations you've seen over time. But first, I guess I'm wondering about from the advertising side, how, I guess like what are the what are the kind of key phrases and ideas that are used to market maple? And I'm trying to, I feel like the, the marketing of maple as a consumer maybe has more, been more subtle to me than a lot of other industries. I can't think of big ad campaigns I've seen. I don't, I can't think of commercials that I've seen. When I think of it, I think it's a little old timey. I think it's got a wholesome kind of reputation. It's got a more of a local, at least as a New Englander. And I think when people buy it, they, they see themselves as, as getting something close to the land. Um, but are there, is there anything that, uh, like how is it advertised or marketed? And what are the kind of things that, that you, you bring up in order to, in those campaigns, um, in order to sort of, s- I don't want to say sell it to the public. I think advertising is a bit like that, but but make it to create public awareness that this is even a product that still exists and, and is out there. I think that the big push in trying to advertise or sell syrup is that it's it's one hundred percent pure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's made one hundred percent. From the sap from the maple trees, nothing is added to it. Mm-hmm. It's all natural. It's um, maple syrup is the most nutritious mm-hmm. because it has a number of minerals in it that you wouldn't get in white yeah, sugar. White sugar, yeah. yeah. And also some some phytochemical. There's some phytochemistry right. there that's coming to light, right? right? Yes, mm-hmm. yes, that are beneficial. The, there is some new research coming out that seems to indicate that diabetics can process the sugar in maple syrup more slowly Mm -hmm. than... I saw the Quebec... Do you you know the name of that molecule? that I can't remember the name. Oh, yeah. But they're saying it slows the absorption of those sugars. Because it is a disaccharide, right? It is sucrose, just like what table sugar, the same sugar molecule now... I've seen some things that say uh, there are additional, maybe there's some glucose or fructose or something like that. So it, there is a bit of a spectrum of sugars, but dominated by sucrose. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, okay. that's true. Yeah. And you, I notice how delicate, I've seen you talk about it in some videos that you have on YouTube as well, where I was like, oh, she navigates the discussion of the consumption of maple sugar like she's on eggshells there. And I'm curious about that as well. Is that why, why that you, um, you seem hesitant to recommend it as a food, but say, if you are going to eat a sugar. <laughs> now, almost every human being I know consumes a, a substantial amount of sugar. I happen to be in a world where I know a lot of people who are on um, different fad diets that are, are extremely sugar restrictive. But having been in the nutrition world for a couple of decades now, I've seen that most people don't do that very long. It tends to be, and I know some of the diehards have written the books about that. And so I know some people who are they are they are pretty dedicated to it, but that's not most people. So right. most people do consume 
sweeteners at some level, even if it's just in the processed food they have. Um, but why do, why do you feel like, I feel like you're on a tightrope when you talk about that. I'm curious. Well, I'm not a, I, I'm not a registered dietitian. Ah, fair enough. Yeah. You know, sure, sure, I, I don't want to overstep my area Understood. of expertise. Yeah. Um, Being a good scientist. And, and there is, there is concern yeah. health wise, mm-hmm. you know, by the medical community as well as dietitians and so on that, we eat way too yeah. much sugar. Up to our eyeballs in it. <laughs> yeah. In many forms, and it comes in most processed food, has yeah. some kind of sugar in it. Yeah, quite a and bit. it's basically not good for us, yeah. for yeah. our health. Yeah. And that's as far as I can go because I'm not a medical doctor. Course, I'm not course. a registered dietitian. <laughs> it's yeah. just fascinating. I think about one of the things I've heard about um, the early Europeans' arrivals here, watching native people go into their sugar bushes looking gaunt and looking sort of malnourished from the long winters and then eating. Now, I the reports that I hear in the ethnographies all the time is eating almost nothing but maple sugar and sap for weeks on end as they cook it and cook it and cook it and coming out, you know, plumped up and pink and glowing and looking so robust and so healthy. The last couple of weeks for me, I would hate to see my glucose love, blood glucose levels <laughs> as I've been cooking sugar and just tasting it and eating it. And I'll find myself waking up in the morning with like a craving for it, you know, and I'm, I am almost looking forward to the end of the season so that I can wind down on the sugar consumption. Um, but it does seem that traditionally it didn't have that same negative impact, maybe because it was a shorter duration of consumption or maybe because it was one of the more exclusive sugars. But, but um, do you are, is the industry uh, carefully navigating this aspect of it as well? Uh, I think so. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. the the industry is promoting the fact that what you eat is your choice. Yeah, yeah, right, right. If you're, because that's how I hear you say it. Right. If you're going to have one, right, can't really then beat make it, it maple. Mm-hmm. You know, because yeah. are you going to get enough of the the beneficial minerals that are in yeah. syrup to make a huge difference in your diet? Well, probably not. Because if you ate enough to get the benefit from the minerals, yeah. you'd be on a sugar yeah. high. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which I have been for yeah. a couple of weeks now. Um, I was always under the impression that grade A syrup and grade B syrup were based on you know somebody pouring off the lighter stuff and, and holding back the dark. I, I, I guess I thought it was like a white sugar and molasses type of deal. And then I started to dig in a little bit deeper and realized, oh, okay, this is, this is actually something else altogether. And I don't know that the general public has a grasp on that. Um, then I saw some work of yours around uh, grading, uh, some work you, you, you were talking about in a video, and realized, okay, the old system's actually changing. So a couple questions in here. What was the old difference between A and B? What is the new standard now, and is that standard going to be adopted through all of these maple producers, or is it something local to Maine right now? Well, I'll answer the second part first. The, the new grading system has been adopted by every state in the U.S. and every province in Canada. Oh, it is. So, Oh, I think now, I might have saw an older video where, you, where it hadn't been yet, maybe, or something. That could be, mm-hmm. yeah. They are now, we now have international standards. And part of the reason that came about was because every state and province was using its own names okay. for the same basic grades mm-hmm. of syrup. In Back in the 1920s or so, 20s or early 30s, FDA said, you know what? Look, there's all these people out here selling all this syrup. It all looks different, and there's no way to quantify what it is. Or what, you know, and so FDA set some standards up, and Canada was busy doing the same thing in Canada. And so they did a survey of all these different colors of syrup and said, you know what? Here's three grades that seem to be the most common. So we're going to call this one, uh, and the names have changed over the years. So we're going to call this light one A, we'll call this medium one B, and we'll call this one C. Mm -hmm. Um, Which sounds like a hierarchy of quality, which isn't necessarily true. That's not right because it's all good syrup, you know. So, but people think they can pay less because they're getting C grade syrup and it's not as good. It's all good. 
And so then they said, no, 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 we'll call them by color names. So then they came up with light amber, medium amber, dark amber, and grade B. And then in Maine, they said, no, that still isn't right because grade B sounds like it's second rate. Yeah, second so, class, yeah. So Maine said, we're going to have light amber, medium amber, dark amber, and extra dark. <laughs> now it's like chocolate. Now that sounds good. good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> extra dark. So we had, we have all, well, we haven't always, but for I think 30 years, Maine had the extra dark. It was all grade A. Still. Dorigo, we still yeah. lead. <laughs> yeah, it was all grade A. But so basically, and in Canada, they had an A, a double A, a, you know, triple A. I mean, everybody had their own. It just got too confusing for consumers. They didn't know what they were buying. And it got confusing for large packers to have to try and pack. Sort well, I'm sending out. this to this state, so I have to have oh, this oh, yeah, label to conform on it. To their rules, yeah. And I'm going to send this to Canada. Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't send anything to Canada. But, you know, Canada <laughs> might send stuff to us. <laughs> and, you know, they would have to change their label to match whatever our states. So Mm -hmm. it took a while because people were pretty, you know, how we are as people, we get really tied to Mm -hmm. our names Mm -hmm. and, and our ownership of those names. So uh, it took about 10 years to, to change those and, and have everybody give up their, you know, their treasured from time immemorial name yeah. of what they called their because the grades were all the same the colors yeah. were all the same right, right. but the names were different mm-hmm. and and the international maple syrup institute did do some research with consumers and the consumers said we don't understand what these color names mean <laughs> you know we want to know what the flavor is yeah. and so that's why now you have a color name and a flavor name so it's golden delicate it's amber rich. It's <laughs> so golden. Golden delicate would be your lightest. Yes. Okay. Then we get into the ambers, and as we go down through that scale from lightness to darkness, is that bringing out those really? Because my my darkest syrups taste the most. They have that buttery maple flavor yeah. to them. That's so rich, and yeah. I would never think that was a bad syrup. And in fact, in some applications, that's exactly that taste that I want. Right. Whereas if I was using it as a pure sweetener, as a substitute sweetener, I might want less of that maple taste. So the, now we're looking at it based on robustness of flavor. Right. Yes. And color as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 So, oh. so, you know, that's what people wanted so mm-hmm. they would understand how to use it. So, and, and it used to be after it got to a certain darkness, you couldn't sell it retail anymore. Well, now, as long as the flavor is good, Okay. You can sell it so dark that you can't even see, see through yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Because that's what consumers And that's what want. are they calling that now? That's the very dark strong. Okay. And the and then you actually are part of or have been part of the development of a of a tasting school. What is that in a nutshell? Well, that's that's part of the grading school and it's a two-day school. That's the one we've been doing for 14 years that we thought we'd do once and be done with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you thought you would run one cycle of it, right. train some people up. And right, and then, and then anybody that wanted to come would have come and we'd be done. Um, but it's still going after 14 years. So what people appreciate is I think the way we structure it is People come, they come for two days, and we talk to them about the four characteristics of grading syrup, the color, clarity, density, and flavor. And so we'll talk about one characteristic, and then we'll do some hands-on of something. You know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll try different color grading kits or, you know, try different density measuring instruments and so on. And then we'll talk about the next one and the next one. And, and then we... We always incorporate, these are the standard grades. This is what they're supposed to taste like. And that's at the end of day one. And then on day two, we have an off-flavor tasting. Oh, okay. So, and... So you get to see what can go wrong. Yeah. Oh, you no can kidding. Good syrup can go bad in a number of ways. In a number of ways. So uh, it really is fun. And... Uh, People seem to really enjoy it. They enjoy the camaraderie. 
They enjoy being in a class with their peers. You know, they always trade information freely back and forth. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do it something this way, or I found out that the best way to take care of this problem is Mm -hmm. by doing this. So there's a lot of transfer of knowledge between them, as well as from what we're presenting. So that lends a real richness to it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's always the off-flavor tasting, which is (laughs) overwhelming sometimes. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, we had one we didn't taste. It was the diesel-flavored. Oh, oh, that can happen. An accident happened, and, you know, something got packed. smell that one. (laughs) In the wrong barrel. Oh, wow. Yeah, Yeah, so... Yeah, we didn't taste that one. <laughs> you didn't have to. A whiff was enough. Yeah, no kidding. You know, but yeah. you know, accidents happen when you think you're you're doing the best that you can do. Yeah. Sometimes things go wrong, and so, like we were saying this morning, you have to keep your head in the game all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, we'll get right back to the interview in a moment, but first domesticated civilized living restricts the natural movement of your human body forcing you daily into chairs, cars, and rigidly defined pathways. But when we head out onto wild landscapes, we carry these dysfunctional, domesticated movement patterns with us. MoveNat is a natural movement system that trains you and your body to move like a human animal again. Are you interested in building natural movement skills that'll improve your physical capability in the field and in everyday life? MoveNat's Level 1 Fundamentals e-course is structured to help you re-educate your body using practical, natural movements that enhance fitness, function, and physical capabilities, all from the convenience of your own home. Learn to move the way nature intended. I attended MoveNat's Level 1 and 2 trainer certification courses a few years back and came away with practical knowledge and skills that I use every day and that have changed the way I train and move across the landscape, vastly improving my overall mobility, coordination, and fitness. This new e-course is movement-rich with clear instruction. Its progression-focused methodology takes you from restorative mobility exercises to challenging movements. All ability levels are welcomed and accounted for. Enroll now at wild-fed.com forward slash movenat for instant access to the full e-course. Again, that's wild-fed.com forward slash movenat, M-O-V-N-A-T. Again, wild-fed.com forward slash movenat for instant access to the full e-course containing 16 classes designed to be followed over four weeks with specific and measurable movement goals for each week. The course is self-paced and you receive lifetime access. MoveNat. I can personally recommend it. It's a fitness and movement system designed for the wild. Now, back to the show. Let's talk about the price of it. I mean, uh, anybody who's bought maple syrup knows that they don't, they don't give it away. Um, anyone who's made it understands that the, f- the costs of production are extremely high. Um, and you mentioned earlier about that 18, I believe you said 1830s report about or, or a column by that person talking about stamping out the the use of sugars from the, the slave industry. Um, I think a lot about, cause I'm able to use in my own household because we produce our sugar and because we're in, I guess, um, you know, a privileged position in the sense that we can do it as hobbyists and it's not about trying to save money over buying food. I do it cause I like doing it. Um, and I'm able to replace sugar uh, of other, other sources of sweeteners in my home with it. But if I was going to do a one-to-one maple against, you know, white sugar or, or fructo, high fructose corn syrup, I mean, economically, maple syrup's really expensive. Uh, so it's hard to imagine it replacing, even though it could essentially replace it from a molecule perspective. Um, what does it cost for maple syrup right now? What kind of fluctuations have you seen in price? And why is it so expensive so that, I mean, I know why, but so that people who, who've never been involved in it understand what the costs are. I think the price has been fairly stable for the last four or five years it's thanks quebec (laughs) thanks to quebec yes um it's fluctuated around 60 65 dollars a gallon and and then you know lesser amounts for the smaller packages but um it's been relatively stable it it's it's either very labor intensive Mm -hmm. or it's very technology intensive Mm -hmm. these days and both of those things cost money 
Uh, fuel as well, though, no? I mean, fuel, yeah. fuel intensive too, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, so the fuel could be either wood or oil if you're using an oil burner in your evaporator. Um, and, and so you may go out and harvest your own wood, but as our small business extension specialist keeps reminding everybody, if you go harvest that wood, it's not free wood because mm-hmm. you've invested your time yeah. and that time has a cost. You could be out doing some other thing, you know. I mean, that's hard labor too. It's not uh, it is. It's not labor that your average American's used to anymore. Right. It's very yeah. hard work. And that so. resource takes time to renew. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, so you, to make syrup, you really have to invest in one or the other. Either you hire people to help and gather the sap and, you know, carry buckets or, uh, harvest firewood or, or run the evaporator for you while you're out doing mm-hmm. the collecting or whatever. That costs money. Mm-hmm. Or you invest in a lot of the new, newer technologies that make that easier. So you invest in tubing mm-hmm. or, and, or, you invest in a reverse osmosis machine to to remove some of that water in the sap. So can, that, I, can we expand that real quick just because sure. while we're on it, and then I want to get back to your thought, is the reverse osmosis is a way to take this sap, which has got a range of sugar in it that would be about what percentage? Around 2%. Okay, so say on average we got about 2% sugar, and the rest is besides whatever dissolved solids are in there and, and phytochemistry it contains – we're talking the rest is water, right? 98% water. So by running it through reverse osmosis, essentially what you're doing is forcing with pressure that those water molecules through that membrane, holding back the sugars and um, getting it down to about, I think we heard today, 10% water at the end. Is that, what was the percentage that it comes down to? Um, It depends. I mean, everybody might set up their RO differently. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it depends how many membranes you have okay. and how yep, much sure. you can concentrate right. it and so on. So, but it, the point being that it does take out some of that water. Yeah. To Which some means degree. then you're using less fuel right. to cook off that remaining right. water and get to the syrup, right? right. Okay. So, uh, that said, you were talking about the investment into infrastructure and that leads me to another question as well is, is it legal for a producer to use steel spiles and buckets still or do they are they required now if they sell into the market does it have to be through the tubing is there any no you it can, can be either yeah, either way you can still yeah. use buckets okay. um you need to use the critical thing is to use food safe materials yeah. whatever you're using so the buckets should be food safe buckets not an old joint compound bucket. Sure. Are the <laughs> old aluminum style buckets still um, considered food safe? Yeah, the yeah. aluminum ones. Are, I imagine but, a lot of people have switched to polymers now. Plastics. Uh, and such. A lot of them do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I see yeah. bags because well, they're so. lighter to carry. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Of course. Or dump or whatever. Yeah. Um, galvanized buckets are no longer. They're no longer approved for organic production. You can't use galvanized equipment at all because mm-hmm. of the potential lead. Okay, which is a great thing. Yeah, something we heard today was that a lot of producers in Maine are certified organic now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. How do they differ, um, those who are certified organic, obviously one way being the restrictions on materials. Um, Are there other things that uh, stand out to you that make a syrup? Because I think a lot of people that I know uh, look at syrup and go, why would I buy the organic one? Because isn't it all kind of, nobody's spraying pesticides on these trees. So why would I spend and thinking it's a gimmick? So could you explain uh, why there might be additional value to the consumer? The, the, what people are supporting if they buy organic syrup is the sugar bush practices. Mm. So organic certification does not allow you to put in more than two taps per tree. Oh, okay. So to, some ecological to make component. the sustainability of the sugar bush, yeah. the, ultimate you know the Mm. most important concept in your sugar bush management is not how much sap you can withdraw from the trees but how can you keep this sugar bush sustainably harvested Mm -hmm. in perpetuity so two taps per tree uh you you can't if you're a certified organic you can't go through the sugar bush and cut out every tree that's not a maple 
Oh, okay. So you have to you have some diversity. You must in there. have a diverse. So there's forestry practices. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, so that's what you're supporting yeah. if you buy organic. What's the cost yeah. difference to, to the consumer at the retail level? Um, I haven't really looked at the prices as from a consumer standpoint. There is a small. Um, there's a small per pound of a few cents uh, bonus to okay. producers that are producing mm-hmm. um, organic syrup. But that'd be another additional cost to them, essentially, is becoming certified and then right. maintaining those practices, right. I would assume. Right. Because we were talking before and, and where we, how we got here is talking about the price. Um, so, yeah, and so there's the infrastructure you were saying. If you start to invest and you want to be at the commercial level, right, quite a, quite a, I mean, the operation I saw today was... Just blew my mind. I mean, right. a lot of infrastructure. Well, to be food safe, a lot mm-hmm. of your equipment, like most of it, should be stainless steel. Mm-hmm. And stainless steel is yeah. pretty expensive. It so, is, yeah. uh, so uh, you can invest in as much or as little technology as you want. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you don't want to hire labor, then you need to, uh, you may need to use technology in your sugar bush, wireless mm-hmm. technology with sensors to tell when are your tanks full or, you know, what's happening out on yeah, this line yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's a trade-off, you yeah. know, but you can't get away from investing money yeah. if you're going to develop a right. commercial operation. Right. So, and, and one of the things I wanted to ask about, I, uh, with the commercial operations, and for those in New England, we see it all the time, even if we're not really connected to the maple industry in some way, even if we're not really consumers, if you live in, at least in Maine, and, you know, even if you live in a more metropolitan area like Portland, doesn't take you don't have to go very far out of town to start seeing that blue tubing that iconic tubing connecting the trees right mm-hmm. um, that's draining that sap down to some central location um, that is not I didn't realize until recently that that's different than when I put a tap in a tree and I hang a bucket on it because I'm just getting the sap that comes from that pressurization in the tree right that's forcing some some amount of psi is pushing that sap out. But these trees are under vacuum. How much more productive is that for a producer when they're running some vacuum on that? So they've got, they're, they're drawing sap off the tree to some degree? They're not really. It's a misconception that they're sucking yeah, the sap sucking out, out of right, the right. tree. What, what the uh, vacuum system does is changes the atmospheric pressure in the Inside tubing the tube. so that the sap will flow. Oh, so it will out. flow. Oh, okay. So okay. it's not like you're, yeah, you're right. draining the Rawr. trees of yeah. their life yeah, blood. Of course, of course, <laughs> you know? So um, it makes a difference in years where you don't have that clear temperature fluctuation. And folks who don't have vacuum will still make syrup but yeah. if but if you don't have those reliably cold nights and warm days without vacuum you're going to have a much more anemic flow generally okay, okay. Yeah. so it's not not a yeah. it, it, w- is there a trim like is there a way to quantify sort of on average the percentage difference between somebody who's running the modern system versus somebody who's doing the bucket system are they somewhat equivalent or are they you know, for how much, if you had equivalent amount of trees and equivalent amount of taps, would you get a, a greater yield running the modern systems to some degree? I would yeah. say yeah. that's that's a yeah. pretty good conclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I just I, I sort of wonder. It's like how do they deliver white sugar at the price that they deliver it to markets at? It's just unfathomable to me that that many calories in that readily usable, you know, disaccharide form can be so inexpensive. When I see what it takes to get it off the landscape here, I mean, it's just sort of mind-numbing to me. But um, I'm curious, too, about um, wh- where, uh, besides syrup, what else is in the market? Like, what else is coming out of um, maple sap? Like, what other products are reaching market? Of course, there's, like, a maple candy, um, and, and um, there's the uh, the spreadable, what do you call that there? Maple, the maple cream. Product. So tell us what yeah. those, what are those products, and, and, and what else might there be? As well. So maple candy is 
is a favorite of many people. It's just syrup that's boiled up to about 234 degrees, cooled slowly, and then stirred, and then poured into a mold. Okay, and but they are pure. They are pure. And, and just There's on what you just added. said for, for people too, a neat science fact is the temperatures. This is one of the interesting things I learned doing the practice was like, oh, I can boil this liquid at higher temperatures than I'm used to seeing. They're not, it's not restricted to uh, 100 Celsius, um, or two, it's 212 Fahrenheit, right? Uh, the temperatures go higher because you're boiling sh- a liquid sugar, correct? Right. That's and, fascinating. And there's still water to boil away right. out of sap, so right. you can get away with that. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, um, so that's one. Uh, maple cream, you heat up to approximately the same temperature, maybe a little higher. You cool it really quickly. And then stir it. And okay. that makes tiny, tiny, tiny crystals. Oh, okay. And so it, it's smooth on your oh, tongue. So, isn't that delicious? But again, oh, pure, that's favorite. pure maple, though. It's pure maple. Because we were trying to again. figure out recently, is there anything I'm reading the bottles? Like, yeah. how do they get it like that? So yeah. It's so all that, about temperature management yeah. and sugar chemistry. Because what a so. delicate and fine product that is. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. Now, some people call that maple butter, but, it, but that's... Cons- confuses people because it doesn't have any dairy that's why, products that's why we in were, it. That's what we were wondering. You know, it's, yeah. And, you know, maple cream uh, has no cream in it. Yeah, right, right. It's 100% maple. We're talking about a spreadable maple product. Right, though. so if yeah. you are lactose intolerant, you can still eat yeah. maple cream right, and right. you won't have a problem. So, What about the up-and-coming um, sap as a product unto itself? Um, I, saw, I saw this. This has been going on for some time, at least at a small level in Quebec, because I would see in shops up there, especially in the health food stores, glass bottled sap. Um, now I'm seeing it here in a variety of tetra packs, cans, bottles, some that have been fermented so they're or, or carbonated. Um, that industry, is it moving? Is it developing quickly? Is it, is it a real thing? Is it going to last? Well, you never know. Um, it could last. You know, it all depends on consumer demand. Yeah. I think that currently... The demand for natural waters is pretty high. Oh, yeah. You know, people are sick of of brightly colored dyed drinks of yeah. one sort or another that, right. you know, and they want something that's um, a little closer to nature, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, it seems like it will last. And That's awesome. I and, love it. Now, is it, this is the next question. Is this, actually sap or is it reconstituted syrup in some cases the international maple syrup institute has set standards for sap beverages okay. and you cannot just reconstitute, reconstitute. syrup that's and that's great so it's the real it. thing it is yes yeah. and and the there are um there's a borderline it can't be more than four percent sugar i think or less than Two and a half percent, or something like that. Okay, I, I so, would yeah, have to look got up some the constraints exact, on what they can it, put into yes, the market under that name. Right. Yeah, I, I just find that real exciting because coconut water has got so popular. Mm-hmm. I've I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in tropical places, and I love drinking coconuts. I mean, I love it. But when I'm up here, I always feel like it's it's unethical, almost. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that, but I I struggle with the idea of exporting up coconut water when we have our own version right Right. here and it's so delicious so yeah that's really exciting um for people who would want to do some hobbyist level um maple production and they have uh maple trees at home what can we learn from the industry's best practices in a smaller scale thing i have 50 taps um what can i do from when i actually tap the tree itself uh, right up through my production to take advantage of what's been learned and uh, and and for for the quality of my product, but also for the the health of my sugar bush too. I think uh, the two most important things: one, only put two taps in your tree. I mean, one tap up to about twenty inches, and one more tap after that. Um, maple trees are under more stress than they have been in the past. So cons- because of because of ozone, uh because of uh pests that are coming in, you know, invasive pests, uh because of the changing climate, these mm-hmm. these wetter junes that we have had have led to a lot more f- uh foliar diseases. 
on from too trees? much moisture. From now, I'm ta- yeah. th- that leads me to another question actually, because and something we didn't cover earlier. All the maple trees, all the maple species here, they all would produce. Sa- I mean, I would imagine that that the striped maple is too small a tree to tap, probably. Uh, in most, in many right. cases, right. Um, but they all do produce a sap, correct? Yes. And I'm tapping red maples primarily because that's what I have. They are going to be more moisture tolerant than, let's say, our sugar maples. So when you when you're saying that about June and the wetness, are you speaking specifically about the um, sugar maples? Because the silver maple would be another um, like riparian tree, right? So it can handle seasonal flooding and things like that. So right, but but the the problem with the wet Junes is the foliar diseases ah because the leaves are out yeah the leaves are out it's wet all june it's cold in june for some reason you know it's cold it's damp it mists for days on a row yeah. and that's perfect conditions for developing foliar diseases okay. which reduce the photosynthesizing area of the leaf and i would and imagine some, that sugar and is some stored- of them are just cosmetic like tar spot okay yeah. it's just an aesthetic problem okay you know but it does reduce the the photosynthetic ability to right some because degree, that right? tar spotted area is not going to be producing now you're talking it almost looks like you dipped your pinky finger on right. there, right but yeah if you take that over the whole surface area of the tree you could calculate out some loss of phos- photosynthetic right. Right. Um, surface area um yeah that's fascinating i hadn't really thought about that okay so um so you know conservative tapping is good for the trees and that will sustain them long term. Wait, one more question about that. <laughs> that is, uh, for people listening who are like wondering, like, how long can you do this? Is this even healthy for the trees? Like, is this sustainable for trees? Um, what would be your sort of, I, you must have like a little canned pitch on that for people who are wondering that. Because people must wonder, you know, hey, if I put a tap in my arm and start draining blood, like this is going to be hard on my body. How, how healthy is this for, or how sustainable is this for the trees um, in general if we follow those guidelines? It's, it's fine for the trees. It mm-hmm. do, yes, it does damage to the tree. And that's why the following year you should move over six inches mm-hmm. and, and up or down the tree because you will, when you put a, a wound in the tree, the tree will respond by walling off around the damage. Yeah. So the other, the other best management practice would be to use the smaller spouts as well. Right. Those are those five sixteenths. The five sixteenths spouts. Because I now I use those, and when I see those older style ones, I look at the size of them. And it's yeah. like my thumb going yeah. into the tree. Right. You know. Right. So the smaller the tap you use, then the the less damage you'll okay. have. But the tree, the tree is going to wall that off so that any infection that could enter through that hole won't spread to the whole tree. Mm-hmm. So that's fine. And it will put a new layer of wood eventually over that wound. So if you cut down a 100-year-old tree that's been tapped for 100 years, um, well, it'd be a 140-year-old tree because you can't tap them until they're around 40 years old. And took a slice out of the center of it, you would see all these dark spots where tap where holes had happened. been. There are and then you would see the new wood that was laid over the top okay. of that. So yeah. eventually you could come back around and tap in that same place. That was another question I had. So so you're saying um, year, year one, I put my tap in at the convenient spot. Then year two, I want to move at least six inches laterally and then is it six inches up or down? Or six or 12. Yeah. Six to 12 up or down yeah. from that. So, right. so essentially we're doing a Charlie Brown t-shirt pattern mm-hmm. over time around the tree. And right. I can work my way back. Yes. Now when I work my way back, I obviously need to be above or below. Right. right. I'm not going to drill into that tissue that I have damaged in the past. Right. right? Well, you won't get any sap out of it. Okay. So. <laughs> right, right. Or if you do, it'll be okay. this uh, kind of... Punky wood yep. smelling sap. Yeah, and it's that. not really very good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What else? So for best management. Uh, so that's the best for the tree. So the best management practice for you as a producer then is to make sure that everything you use is clean, clean, clean. The the mistaken concept maybe is that oh well I'm going to boil a syrup so it doesn't matter. I'm mm. going to boil the sap. So it doesn't matter what I do to it, but it does matter. So clean buckets in the spring um, and food grade equipment. Yeah. So, you know, don't go out and 
get the old drill bit that you've been drilling into mm. greasy, oily, whatever with, you right, know, right. get a drill bit that's that you keep just for tapping your trees. Yeah. Make sure it's clean. Uh, clean the buckets out with hot water. Uh, don't clean them out with soapy detergent and then not rinse them very well right. or you'll have detergent flavored syrup which is really not very good <laughs> that sounds terrible yeah, yeah it is yeah. um clean 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 keep it clean clean it during the season you know as you empty your bucket out if it looks kind of gooey in, right, <laughs> inside right. yeah. you know rinse it out with some hot water and then hang it back on the tree yeah. um and process it Process the sap into syrup as fast as you can because syrup, sap will spoil just like milk. Yeah. Okay. What's the future looking like? Um, I was reading something out of Vermont's uh, Proctor Maple Research um, Facility. They were talking about the effects and impacts of climate change. And they were saying that the old adage of tap in, what was it, March 1st, I think was what people always said, uh, is changing now. Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen? Are you seeing changes? And what does the future look like? To what degree are um, are people who are in the maple industry having to adjust? Are they already having to adjust? And, and what do you see the future looking like? Yes, they are already adjusting. Um, it used to be you tap by the calendar, you know, mm -hmm. like what you heard. Oh, I tap on town meeting day. You know, <laughs> yeah. the first Monday in March, I yeah. tap. That's when I tap. And... That's when the season used to be. But now you really have to pay attention to the weather because the conditions for sap to flow might be occurring at the end of January mm -hmm. or into February. Yeah. And you may have perfect conditions, which we did a few years ago. We had the most perfect conditions for the last 10 days of January. And then February, the state froze solid. And then it, in March, it we had a perfect uh, stretch of weather again. And then it hit 70 degrees two or three days in a row, and that was it. It was over. Wow. So if you didn't get that January run, yeah. you know, your season was 10 days, and you yeah. didn't make much syrup. Right, right. So uh, that's how people are adjusting. The, yeah. They are no longer saying, it's March, I'll tap in March. They're saying, hmm... I listen to the weather, and yeah. we're going to have the right conditions, so I'm going to get out there and get tapped. And Yeah, makes sense to watch nature and not just the Gregarian calendar. It's sort of a yeah. slightly made-up anyway, right? Artifact. Um, what what kind of um, closing words might you have for people who um, either, I guess, there's there's people just listening who are just like, oh, interesting story. I live in arizona this isn't relevant but i think it's interesting uh we, there's people can mail syrup to arizona yes exactly they can have syrup there uh there's people who are consumers of syrup there's people who are going to uh go out and and tap some trees after hearing this they'll go okay that's my push that's, i'm really excited by this idea um hobbyists um so what kind of parting words do you have for people after you spent a considerable, how much time, how long have you been working in, in the maple industry or, or around the maple industry? About 20 years. Yeah. So, oh. you know, what, what's sort of your closing and parting ideas for people? who? Well, would you like some of the tired old puns? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll get take whatever you got. Maple people are the sweetest people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they never get tapped out. <laughs> Yes. There's no other industry that's so ripe for awful puns. <laughs> but the syrup yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. So my parting words would be, it may seem expensive, but the the flavor is unmatched by anything. Yeah, by anything. You are going to get a little bit of nutrition out of it. Is that enough? Don't ask me. I'm not the nutritionist. Yeah. Um, and if you make your own syrup, Nothing will ever taste as good to you oh, as the so syrup true. you make yourself. That's so, so true. if you have a tree, give it a try. Mm. It, it's really fun. And if you have kids, it's a great experience for them. So, Where do people find the work that you've done on this? Um, we'll put links to everything you mentioned. Um, we have uh, on extension... Uh, uh, extension.umaine.edu... We have a 
we have a lot of resources on agriculture and, and gardening and horticulture and so on. Uh, there's one area on our website that's called Natural Resources, and if you click on that, then uh, all of the maple, oh, the great. videos come up, the, the maple publications come up, the maple food safety plan website will come up. It's all clickable there, so... This has been really fun for me. Thank you so much. I like to do this deep dive and, and learn everything I've learned today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your hospitality. It's been really You're great. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.